These sessions support positive interactions among family members and help to raise awareness around child maltreatment and healthy child development. Secondary prevention addresses a specific threat and or vulnerabilities of children identified as being at high risk of harm. Rather than targeting all children in a population or subpopulation, secondary prevention identifies children and families at high risk of harmful outcomes and addresses the root cause of harm for those specific children. An example of this would be local organisations identifying an adolescent girl with a form of disability in a single-headed household as potentially at risk of sexual violence or exploitation and referring her to life skills sessions for adolescents at risk of harm. Tertiary prevention targets individual children who have experienced harm and aims to reduce the longer-term impact of harm and reduce the chances of recurring harm. An example of tertiary prevention would be local organisations in a refugee camp identifying and then assisting a displaced child who is separated from family and is being cared for by an elderly woman. This assistance could include the child receiving case management support, including psychosocial support and referral to other necessary services, the adult receiving livelihood support, and the care arrangement being formalised as appropriate to the situation of the separated child and the adult. To find out more about prevention within child protection in humanitarian action, please visit the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action website. Excellent. So, we are now going to have a quiz. Not on what you just saw, though you will be tested on that later, so you know, retain that information. But rather we want to talk about why are we emphasizing prevention so much. We've heard it mentioned every day this week, right? So why is, the, why is it one of the Alliance's strategic priorities? We have a Menti meter, so I'll ask you to join at menti.com using the code 61465944. Four, four. So why is prevention a strategic priority? Um, because we have an ethical responsibility, because it's part of the child protection definition, it's more sustainable, it's cost effective, um, it's ethical or a combination of those answers. So I see some answers coming in. And I'll let people take a little time to log in. Um, all right, so I see that we have a couple of, um, we have a clear winner here that it's an ethical responsibility. Uh, it, so answers A, C, and D, that it's an ethical responsibility. It's more sustainable and it's cost effective. Um, in second place, we have the little trick one that I put in there for you, which is uh, that it's an ethical responsibility. It's part of the definition um, and that it's more sustainable. So. Um, the majority are right. We have an ethical responsibility to prevent harm before it can occur. While yes, prevention is literally part of the definition of what we do, um, that only scratches the surface of why it's so important to invest in a primary prevention approach. It's an ethical responsibility. We should not just be responding to harm, but we should be seeking to prevent harm. Uh, after, we should not be seeking to respond to harm after it's occurred, but to prevent harm for outcomes happening to children in the first place. Second, adopting pre preventive approaches will ensure the sustainability and the long-term impact of humanitarian programming. If we can effectively prevent harm before it occurs, our capacity and resources available to respond will also be greatly strengthened. Um, and finally, it's cost-effective. Um, there's a great example that uh, I once heard about how in the US there were increasing numbers of visits to emergency departments because of car accidents, because it was not a requirement to wear seatbelts. Wearing seatbelts was just not something that people commonly did. And so emergency rooms were being packed with people in car accidents who had had injuries that could have been prevented. One solution would have been to continue building hospitals and training doctors, which would have been quite cost uh, intensive. Another option, and what actually happened, was that doctors and nurses banded together 
and led a social behavior change campaign, advocated to government, and passed a law that made seatbelts a legal requirement. That is much more sustainable than having to keep on building hospitals and clinics to respond to preventable harm. Um, and then finally, uh, and, and then we do also have evidence from non-humanitarian child protection efforts and other humanitarian sectors that indicate that prevention interventions are more cost effective than response focused programming. Now, I want to be careful to say here that we're not saying that response programming is not important. It is essential and it will always be essential. But we also need to be placing emphasis on how we can prevent harm. So what is the prevention initiative? Now that we know what is prevention, why it's important, what is the prevention initiative? Um, prevention was identified as a secondary priority in the Alliance Strategic Plan from 2018 to 2020, and it became one of the four main priorities in the Alliance strategy for 2021 to 2025. The prevention initiative officially started in 2020, thanks to funding from both the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance and PRM. Um, and the, name, the aim of the initiative was to promote increased understanding and prioritization of efforts to prevent harm to children in humanitarian settings. Leading this initiative is an advisory group formed by a diverse group of actors. We have local NGOs, international NGOs, academics, UN agencies, um, networks of support. Um, and as of September 2023, we had 33, member, 33 agencies and 39 members represented. Um, the key resource that has been developed by the uh, prevention initiative is the primary prevention framework for child protection and humanitarian action. This framework, which I'll just refer to as the framework for the rest of the, of the session, provides guidance for humanitarian workers on the key actions and considerations to apply when developing or implementing um, programming to prevent harm to children in humanitarian settings at the population level. So this focuses on that primary prevention population level approach. And it's organized according to the program management cycle. So giving key steps at the preparedness phase, the needs assessment and situation analysis phase, and on through the learning and evaluation phase. Um, it also links to additional supporting resources and tools. This framework also outlines the eight key um, guiding principles for effective prevention programming, which can be applied across all of the phases. So it talks about the importance of taking a multi-sectoral approach. And we've talked about this a lot this week. We have to address the whole of the child. If we want to prevent harm before it occurs, we need to be working across sectors. Another key point is that we need to work across the socio-ecological model. Um, and so each of these principles are detailed further in the framework. Um, this framework was developed as a result of an extensive desk review of hundreds of documents. I believe it was over 300 documents reviewed across both academic and gray literature, um, as well as because, through consultations with child protection practitioners um, from national NGOs, international NGOs, the UN, um, and onwards. So we have our primary prevention framework. It has been developed in an interagency manner with lots of inputs from across child protection actors but the next step that we needed to do was then test it. We need to generate evidence about the effectiveness and the impact of the primary prevention framework and of taking primary preventive approaches. So we, uh, you know, we pursued new funding opportunities through the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance to pilot this framework. And what's really exciting is that we actually are piloting it through each step. So our project was to say, we don't know what activities we're going to be implementing. Our activity we're implementing is to implement the framework step by step. Um, and this gave us an opportunity to really ground the framework in the reality of field level work and to really see how, you know, how this framework works and how primary prevention works um, when act in the realities of a humanitarian assistance, which as we all know can be quite challenging. Um, it was also an opportunity to develop and test m and &E frameworks to seek to measure harm averted. How do you measure harm that doesn't happen? How do you determine that that outcome is achieved? Um, the pilots will inform revisions of the primary prevention framework, as well as a monitoring and evaluation addendum to that framework. 
um, and evidence generated from these pilots will feed into advocacy efforts to promote preventive approaches, both within our community, but as well as across other sectors and across donors. So, we are now piloting the framework. Uh, we are nearing the end of the pilot process, actually, and we selected two countries for piloting, Niger and South Sudan. Um, we were specifically looking for contexts where we had strong uh, multi-sectoral programming um, and where there was also strong coordination mechanisms. So, so far we have covered preparedness, needs assessment, uh, design and planning, and implementation and monitoring. And I'm going to take you through each of those steps and what we have learned as we have gone along. So, the first phase was to do uh, a needs assessment and situational analysis. Um, but first we needed to ask ourselves, what harmful outcome, like what, what, what are we targeting? What are we working on here? What harm are we seeking to prevent? So we conducted an extensive desk review of needs assessments, humanitarian needs overviews, and HRPs and other available resources, as well as consulted with our project teams and with our, the communities that we're working in to determine what were the priority harmful outcomes for them. Um, and once we had those harmful outcomes, we then needed to identify the risk factors that were driving those harmful outcomes and the protective factors that helped keep children safe from those harmful outcomes. To do that, we conducted a risk and protective factor ranking exercise using a tool developed by the Prevention Initiative with funding from PRM. Um, and we actually, in field testing this, ended up doing a lot of modifications to simplify the resources, make them more field ready. But essentially, what this involved was conducting focus group discussions across different target audiences, um, including separate focus group discussions for boys and girls or men and women as necessary. And in this the focus group discussions, we would introduce the goal of the exercise. We would explain what are risk and protective factors and what we're seeking to achieve in very simple terms and using very simple tool tools. We then discussed with our participants the risk and protective factors present in the community for the selected harmful outcomes, and then ask them to rank those the risk and protective factors in order of you know, top priority. What do you think is most contributing to this harmful outcome? Or what do you think is most you know, helping to protect children from this harmful outcome? We then had to compile and analyze the findings across all of these. I think we did something like 11 focus group discussions. Um, and to determine across all of these focus group discussions, what were the top risk and protective factors? We have tools for each step of this. Um, a surprising number of tools, actually, because this process was more complicated than we initially thought, but we were able to put together tools that simplifies it, and they will be released as part of this process. So our next step uh, was to do a prioritization workshop, right? So we, we know we have these risk and protective factor ranking, these risk and protective factors, but which ones are we going to be able to address most effectively? So working with key stakeholders, representatives from different sectors, from the government, from um, our own child protection teams, from the clusters, we ranked based off of impact and feasibility each risk and protective factor. Um, and we found it was really key to define what we mean by impact and what we mean by feasibility. So first of all, with impact, it is what will we as a humanitarian team be able to impact the most? What will we actually be able to ha and have a change? Um, and what is feasible? What is feasible for us to achieve? Not necessarily within the limited time frame of our funding cycle, but with our, in our own areas of expertise and responsibility. Um, these were all discussed and then entered, I'm sorry, this is very crowded, but for me to show it even bigger would be slightly challenging, but it was entered into a, um, an automatic prioritization tool that in a really exciting way actually mapped for us what we should be prioritizing. So what we have um, on the, and this is bringing me back to my math days, on the x-axis, so along the horizontal line, is feasibility. How feasible is it for our programming to address this risk factor? or this protective factor. And along the y-axis, or the, the vertical line, 
is the impact, what impact will working on this have? And the goal is to prioritize those risk and protective factors you see in the top right corner where we will have both high impact and high feasibility. Um, we found this to be really interesting discussions um, in terms of like what is feasible and we really had to keep in mind the limitations we face within a piloting program. Um, but I want to kind of pause first and ask you about some questions about risk and protective factors. So which of the following was a risk factor according to focus group discussion participants? Having a disability, being out of school, the girl's size, her, her height, her weight, her physical um, attributes. All right, that's an interesting, I see being out of school is really seen as a key uh, risk factor. Um, will this show the correct answer? No. Um, so the correct answer actually um, on what was a risk factor for what was considered a risk factor was actually being out of school and the girl's size. Those were both listed as risk factors. The, um, the logic being that if a girl's healthy, has a good weight, she's more at risk of being seen as desirable for marriage. Um, having a disability was actually listed as a protective factor because for community participants, a, woman, a girl with a disability would be less likely to be desired in marriage. Um, our next question is, access to basic needs was listed as a blank factor. Was it a risk factor? Was it a protective factor? Was it both or was it neither? I see that there's a general consensus that it was both. Exactly. Access to basic needs showed up as both a protective factor and a risk factor. And then finally, education is a blank factor. Is it a protective factor, a risk factor, neither or both? I see I did manage to trick you guys. It is both. We found it to be listed as both by participants. So this really ties into the challenges and the lessons learned we had from this exercise and from determining risk and protective factors. So first, we felt that participants may not have fully understood what we meant by a risk and protective factor. And it demonstrated to us that it had to be very clear what we are looking for and to really walk through and take the time to explain the exercise. For example, a healthy girl was listed as a risk factor um, and being unhealthy or having a disability was listed as a protective factor. Now, it, it's understandable that a community is, is naming these as risk and protective factors because quite literally on the surface, that is a consideration. However, what we need to determine and what we discussed as a team was, okay, so what might be the underlying risk factor that we can address? We're obviously not going to be going around saying, all right, we want all of the girls to be malnourished. Like, that's not the solution. Um, but the underlying risk factor here, and what we had to discuss really in depth, was that the social and cultural norms that mean child marriage is normalized is the risk factor. It's the harmful cultural norm. That means that people will see a healthy girl and say, well, she's, she's prime for marriage. So that's what would need to be worked on. Um, we also saw that participants very often listed what they theoretically considered a risk factor or a protective factor, rather than listing risk factors and protective factors that were actively present, um, which then kind of reiterated, we needed to ground this in their current context. Um, we also found that at the same time, risk and protective factors are two sides of the same coin frequently. So inability to access education is a risk factor, while accessing education is a protective factor. It could be listed as a protective factor that is present in a community because there are students attending school, 
but it could also be listed as a risk factor for those children in the community who are out of school. It is therefore important to fully understand the root causes or rather the additional risk factors for children being out of school. So we have a school operating, but we see children out of school. So yes, there's access to education, but children are not in school. Why not? And then to delve deeper into the next layer of why this is happening and to consider that as well as a risk factor. But through this, we can also realize that risk factors are often interlinked and compounding. So a school exists, but there's children out of school, which is a risk factor for child labor. Why are children out of school? They are out of school because parents and caregivers can't access livelihoods to pay for scholastic materials for them to attend school, which means they're out of school, but also means that they're at increased risk for child labor. So looking at how these are interlinked and compounding each other. Um, you know, we also found that the same happened with the prioritization exercise around needing to really understand the, the goal of the exercise. Like, you know, we could say that we would have like a huge impact if we achieve this, but if, if this risk factor was mitigated, there'd be a huge impact. But then the question of is it actually feasible um, was something that we really had to kind of drive home to, to participants. So we really understood from this exercise that it's important to familiarize all participants with key terminology um, and that it's critical for participants to understand the goal of the exercise. So you really need to take your time doing this um, and make sure that you are fully familiarizing participants in, in these um, topics. Um, so based off of that, apologies, we then Prior, so to, to then give you an overview of what we had identified as harmful outcomes and what were prioritized as risk and protective factors based off of our consultations with communities and stakeholders. In Niger, the harmful outcome we focused on is child marriage, with key risk factors being lack of access to livelihoods, education, as well as birth, as well as birth registration. Um, protective factors, was having quality education, positive parenting, and ability to meet basic needs. So as you can see, these are very interlinked. In South Sudan, we are focusing on child marriage and child labor with similar risk factors and protective factors. Once again, you're seeing lack of access to livelihoods, lack of access to quality education, including extracurricular activities, inclusive education as protective factor, and the ability to meet basic needs. So our next step was then to design a primary prevention approach. Um, how do we, what activities can we use, what project can we implement to strengthen protective factors and mitigate risk factors? And what we really found was that this process took longer than we anticipated. Um, and we learned that it's really challenging to develop a primary preventive approach and that it's necessary, and then in order to do so, just because we're so used to thinking about things in terms of response, in terms of harm has occurred, people are already vulnerable to this. How do we respond to this harm? And instead thinking, how do we prevent it from happening? Um, and we, it was necessary to rethink how we approach existing interventions. Um, there was also certain limitations. You know, this is a pilot project. It's not going to be a long, two year long, program. We are looking at, you know, a limited time frame and a specific budget. So we also had to kind of work within those parameters, which, you know, actually led to a lot of really creative thinking. Um, and so it took several iterations to land on the activities that we felt would, within these limitations, represent a strong primary preventive approach. Um, and so now we're going to actually do a quiz. Uh, based off of the various iterations of the log frames we developed. As part of this step, we developed theories of change, we developed goals, outcomes, activities, indicators, a whole log frame, and m and &E plan. And so I'm gonna do a quiz um, where hopefully you'll remember what you learned in the video about what is a primary preventive approach. So go back into your mentee. Uh, is this, a primary preventive approach. Vulnerable caregivers participate in a VSLA, in a Village Savings and Loan Association. Mm -hmm. 
oh wow, we're, we're uh, pretty neck at neck here. So no, we would not consider this a primary preventive approach. Can anybody tell me why? Sure, I'll, uh, let me come down to you with the mic. Oh, I did not plan for interactiveness. This is exciting. Um, uh, because they're vulnerable caregivers, they've been specifically targeted for their vulnerability, whereas if it was all caregivers, it would be primary preventive. Excellent, I wish I had like a prize to hand out. Um, Maybe, maybe, maybe next annual meeting. <laughs> exactly. We're looking at vulnerable caregivers. That's the key word in this question. Rather than taking a population or a subpopulation based approach, we're looking at somebody who we already know is vulnerable to this harm. Next question. Adolescent life skills sessions. And this is pulled directly from the log frame. This is not me trying to trick you guys. This is what, what we kind of, the teams had initially drafted. All right, yes. Uh, this, is, this is me tricking you guys because it could really be either. We don't have enough information, right? Um, it depends on how we are targeting this. Like, are we doing adolescent life skills lessons for um, children at risk of, of gender-based violence or for unaccompanied and separated children who are participating in a child-friendly space? In that case, it would not be a primary preventive approach. But if we are doing adolescent life skills for all, like, all adolescent girls in a community, that would be considered a primary preventive approach. All right, just, just one more. Um, and I'm sorry, this one's only in Spanish because it was a lot of words. Um, <laughs> so all children out of school um, are supported to enroll in school and are provided with uh, scholastic materials to support their attendance. Excellent. Yes, this would be considered a primary preventive approach. We're looking at a subpopulation. We're looking at all children out of school to be supported to enroll and to also continue attending. Um, this is actually one of the activities we ended up including. Um, in, I believe in Niger and South Sudan, was looking at, you know, if you have children who are out of school as a specific subpopulation, it does not mean that they're necessarily at risk of harm or that they're vulnerable to harm, but it means, but we do know that if they have additional vulnerabilities, that is what would make them more vulnerable. So we want to look at a population level of having education available, but also children enrolled and retained in education. All right, so what were the challenges in our lessons learned? And there were, there were a couple here. We did see um, teams, like, we did struggle with uh, understanding what's a population versus a subpopulation versus a vulnerable group. Um, and this was, this was like kind of one of the trickier parts because it, people very, you know, our team, we very frequently then began debates around, well, is this a subpopulation or is this a vulnerable group? Like, how do you, how do you distinguish these two? Um, and it was something we really needed to work through as a team. And you know, I, you know, Hani did a lot of review on these uh, log frames and provided a lot of great feedback. So having also like external, um, you know, supporters who were able to kind of review and feedback and say, well, have you thought about it this way? Um, but like one thing that I found helped was like using an example of of child marriage, um, and thinking about what would be a population, subpopulation, and vulnerable group in that situation for that harmful outcome. The population would be everyone in the community, like if you're targeting everyone in the community with social behavior change campaign. A subpopulation might be every adolescent girl. Not every adolescent girl in the community is going, is out of school and therefore at risk of, of child marriage or is likely to be engaged in child and early forced marriage, but we work with all of them on a social behavior change campaign anyways. And then a vulnerable group would be adolescent girls out of school. Gracias. Gracias, thank you. Um, so that's kind of a good way to think about it um, and to frame it. But it really helps when you're kind of thinking it through and talking it through with colleagues. So uh, what we then saw was that, um, you know, we needed to think about how we normally approach activities so for example, um, well, we need to think about what actually makes an activity primary prevention. Um, because we're talking about a population or a subpopulation approach, 
our instinct was mostly to include awareness raising and social and behavior change activities. Um, because we were working at a population. How do you do a livelihoods activity with an entire population, right? Um, or how do you do you know, positive parenting sessions with an entire population? And so there was initially a very heavy reliance on advocacy efforts and awareness raising um, because we didn't feel like it would be possible with how we normal, with activities that we normally do would be possible. And while social and behavior change campaigns or advocacy are really essential to prevention, um, we also need to be working across the socio-ecological model. And it is possible to do activities that we traditionally do in a more secondary or tertiary preventive approach at a population level. The difference is how we're determining participants. Who are we working with? And this also then ties into the fact that primary preventive approaches are necessarily longer term, um, which is one of the challenges that we face. Um, so, and next we also realized it can be challenging to discuss and to determine how do you measure harm averted. So as part of the design and planning process, we developed monitoring and evaluation plans. We developed outcome level indicators, output level indicators, and we wanted to measure both the success of the activities themselves, but then looking longer term, how do we determine that child labor has been prevented, that child and early forced marriage has been prevented? And so we needed to look at proxy indicators, right? So thinking about if we want to you know, prevent child labor, yes, over time, you're able to measure and document decreases in levels of child labor if it, you know, with population level surveys, but how can we as a child protection team try to see what we've been able to impact? So looking at, um, you know, so both looking at how do we work more broadly in the long term on this, but then what, what would be our indicators that we measure this with? Um, and so this kind of also ties back with a key limitation, which is the time frame of the piloting. We recognize that um, within uh, the period that we have, you know, these are longer term outcomes that we see over time. Um, but then also thinking through, so what can we what can we do now to kind of project those outcomes? Um, looking at different, um, I'm not an ME expert, so I won't go into too much detail here. Um, but looking at you know tools that we do have or methodologies we do have that can kind of do like a harvesting approach. So um, I won't go into all of the activities that we're doing and, we're and that we're including, but we did look at essentially having, um, we, we did find also that we are taking an integrated approach. You'll see up here at the outcomes, at the outcome level that we are working in education and livelihoods and more legal protection. You know, like actually, for this, for our piloting in Niger, none of these outcomes read like a child protection outcome, right? Like we have a, we have a livelihoods outcome, we have a, an education outcome, we have a more legal protection outcome. Um, and it really shows how important it is that when you're preventing harm that we are being multi-sectoral and that we are being integrated. But what we also have within each of these outcomes are child protection activities. Um, Participants in livelihood opportunities, and caregivers who are involved in that are also doing positive parenting curriculums. We're looking to multiply impacts by working at a population level by focusing on the catchment population for the Joro Colo school. So all the students that we're supporting with access to education and retention, it's their caregivers who are involved and it's caregivers from those schools that are involved in our livelihoods programming. And then this is a, an overview of our, our South Sudan. Um, and we also have included, so, and you'll see here in these, well, I'm happy to share the actual activities separately if you'd like to see them. But what we see in our activities is that we're also working across the socio-ecological model. We have parenting courses. We have livelihood courses that are taking place at a family level, at an individual level. But then we also have awareness raising activities as well as advocacy activities that are taking place at more of a community and societal level. So uh, finally, I'm just being mindful of time because I wanna make sure we have some time for Q&A. Um, we are now in the implementation and monitoring phase, um, which has included doing a baseline exercise, a midpoint risk and protective factor monitoring exercise. Um, and we're actually wrapping up pilot activities this month. Um, and so what have we learned? 
Um, I've covered a lot of this already, right? Like we've learned that we need increased engagement and tailored advocacy to key stakeholders. We found that there's a lot of external factors that we can't control and that we can't necessarily address, but that we need to work in collective advocacy and collective action with other sectors, with donors, with government stakeholders to address these challenges. For example, in Niger, one of the key challenges we've had with our enrollment campaign is that children who don't have their school records are not able to enroll. So we're working with a displaced population who may have lost their school records, who are prevented from enrolling because of administrative reasonings. So we've been working with the schools and with the Directorate of Education to try to encourage flexibility in that. But that's not something we can necessarily change except through advocacy, but it's about building those partnerships, working together to address these challenges. Um, we are also learning that integrated approaches are extremely critical. Um, we have found that participants in the monitoring workshops have actually said that um, having financial literacy training combined with positive parenting training is having a tangible impact. They're both seeing um, that they have like the necessary skills to run a small scale business, um, but that they are, are also gaining those skills to be positive caregivers at the same time. Um, we have received a lot of positive feedback about this integrated approach and how they are linked together and seeking to achieve an outcome for children. And we throughout these activities have been emphasizing and advocating the fact that we're working on these livelihood activities to ensure your children stay in school, to ensure your children don't have to engage in child labor and working on that together. And why is this important? Why are we working on this? Um, and they've said that they're observing positive changes, both in parents and caregivers' knowledge related to, to caring for their children, but also in their ability to, to access livelihood opportunities. Um, we are also learning about the importance of including social and behavior change uh, approaches. Um, and that this is a crucial component. Uh, we know that social norm and behavioral change campaigns and uh, work requires extensive time and participation. Our participant feedback indicates that it is a crucial component to include in the design. Um, for example, in South Sudan, when we did our midpoint abbreviated risk and projected factor ranking exercise, these were rated as even more important than they had been in our first exercise. Um, and finally, I want to just again emphasize the importance of a collective approach. This can't just be one NGO or one sector promoting a primary preventive approach. We need to all be, be working together um, and understanding how working together then promotes the rights of children and prevent harm. Um, and it needs involved um, coordination and buy-in across all of us and not just humanitarian NGOs, development NGOs, government counterparts. Um, et cetera. So, next slide. What's next um, is the, and actually I meant to revise this. Um, so, this has been slightly revised. What's next is the learning and evaluation phase. We want to do an end line assessment for our outcome indicators, see what, how has the needle moved. Um, we're going to repeat the risk and protective factor ranking exercise, again, to see what has changed in terms of community perceptions of risk and protective factors. We're going to evaluate the prevention of identified harmful outcomes. We're going to conduct an evaluation of the success of the primary preventive approach we took. And then we're also going to evaluate how well the prevention framework itself informed piloting across each step. And this will then inform revisions to the framework itself, as well as the development of additional tools. Um, one thing that we have learned is that we really need some additional like, concrete tools to support implementation. Um, and then we're going to share learnings. We're going to have our learnings from this piloting inform advocacy approaches. Um, so we have a question and answers part, which I want to reserve the rest of this time for. But really quickly, I want to just touch on what's up next for the prevention initiative. Um, really quickly, we are wrapping up piloting. We are doing our end line assessments, evaluations. We will have a webinar we're planning to schedule in September that's going to be on the evaluations and on our learnings. Um, we will then have a, an additional webinar at the end of the year on our reflections of the overall process. Um, we will keep you informed as those are officially scheduled. Um, but we are also going to be restarting virtual clinics. This is a key resource that is provided as part of the prevention initiative. 
Um, we have recently recruited a primary prevention focal point for the Alliance. Um, she will be starting in July. And this is a service we offer to Alliance members, to child protection practitioners. There are virtual clinics where you get to work with the primary prevention focal point to design preventive approaches, to lead trainings for your teams. And so she is going to be a key resource to help you adapt and implement primary preventive approaches. And so that's available for anyone who's interested. Um, you can reach out to myself or to the prevention email, uh, which I do have at the bottom of the slide. Um, and those are one-on-one -on -one sessions, those are group sessions, and they're really key and supportive. We run a few of these last year and had really positive feedback. Um, we're also incorporating the learning from these sessions and from the work you're doing to implement uh, preventive programming into the revisions of the framework. So this is really important for our learning as well. Um, second, we do have a prevention advocacy roadmap, um, pointing at Elspeth there. We are going to be taking our learnings and evidence generated from piloting and implementing that advocacy roadmap over the rest of this project period um, and beyond. Um, so keep your eye out for events that will be coming up as we look to, you know, um, to implement these learnings on the importance of working together and convincing others on the importance of, of preventive approaches. So that's what we have coming up. Um, and I would like to hand it over to questions. So I think I actually need to move my mic. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's very interesting and a uh, congratulation to move on that, uh, on that uh, long uh, awaited uh, agenda. Um, I wanted to know if you could reflect on the multi-sectoral engagement from the planning phase, because in fact, when you want to address the, 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 the prevention, the primary prevention, you know, you need to engage many different sectors as uh, your example uh, showed and did, did you start from the planning to engage them to start to reflect and uh, you know to to bring them uh, on board when uh, when you were uh, um, designing the the the, the, the project yeah. yes absolutely so we actually even kicked off the whole piloting process by having a training across all of the plan um, sectors and teams in that country on primary prevention and on the framework. So we started with that multi-sectoral integrated approach from even before the needs assessment. And then when we were at the designing phase, we brought everyone together in a workshop to design activities together. So we had livelihoods advisors, education advisors, child protection advisors. And it was really successful because that then meant we had the buy-in from those sectors um, and that they have actually been actively supporting the implementation of piloting. Um, we also developed a budget that went with this. So um, because obviously with a, with a project, you need, you need a budget. And so that meant that it was really a, an integrated budget as well that included budget for each sector. Um, and I'm also happy to, you know, we're going to be, doc we've, we're documenting the process. We will be releasing case studies on this process that will include all of that information as well. Um, because I think it was a really, you know, conducive way of working with other sectors. Thank you very much. I have, uh, actually my question is the question of curiosity because you mentioned Niger mm -hmm. and I saw Nifa. So you, among the preventive, um, approaches that you mentioned there is actually maintaining children at school mm -hmm. uh, but currently DIFA is uh, facing challenges and also grave violations against children and attack on schools is one of them closure of school as well so I wanted to know first of all if uh, you had a chance to look at this issue of prevention of child marriage within the angle of uh, conflict as well. And the second question is related to alternative where schools are not available. Mm -hmm. So this is an excellent question and this was definitely one of the challenges we had with piloting, right? And this is a challenge more broadly with a primary preventive approach. We are working in contexts that change rapidly, that evolve rapidly. And as you mentioned, in Niger, in DIFA, security of schools is an issue. So this was a consideration when we were, you know, even selecting locations for piloting. And we really relied on our, on our plan's existing presence and knowledge to make sure we were selecting a location where we felt we would be able to implement um, pilot activities safely and, and be able to follow those through to the end. So this was a consideration. Um, 
And I mean, I would say that those were all questions that that we we had as we were piloting and and how do we address this? And I would say, um, do you mind just reminding me of the second part of your question? Alternative, whereas mm -hmm. schools are non-existent. So we fortunately in this in this pilot did not have to consider that. But what I would say is that if we're thinking about that, like alternatives where schools aren't existent and how do we prevent harm, it would come down to the risk and protective factor ranking exercise again. We prioritize access to education because our findings were that was a priority concern um, and that it was something that we, it was feasible for us to address and that would have a high impact. If we redo that exercise, and this is why the risk and protective factor exercises are so important to contextualize and not to and to do in the areas where you're planning to work. We would, in a situation where there are not schools available, we would identify other protective factors that we could seek to strengthen. Um, and that would just mean that we would have a very different approach. And that's one of the keys with prevention programming is that each intervention is very tailored and targeted to the area you're working in, to your local context. Um, and, and therefore, the risk and protective factors are going to be very unique and tailored to that, and your response will be as well. I was um, thinking then in this uh, prioritization exercise, did you only rely on people's perspective from the community or for, from where you worked? Or did you also consider research and, you know, like more global research findings? Because I can see how, like, personally, you can have a strong opinion about something mm -hmm. which may not be you know, totally true, mm -hmm. or could be biases, uh, biased by your own perception filters, you know. So that's Precisely. So that was one of our considerations. Um, so that's why we did an initial desk review of both like the, the humanitarian needs um, overview and the HRP for the location we were working in, existing needs assessments that we had done in those locations, um, as well as the existing knowledge and experience of, of plants teams, but as well as, as other actors present in those locations, but then also taking into consideration what do we know more globally? Um, and so considering what have we already learned? So for example, with child marriage and DIFA, plan has already done a lot of work on early child and early forced marriage in that region and doing research on risk and protective factors. So we were able to use that to also inform what we are learning from community participants and to really try to have a comprehensive holistic approach. Um, I will say that I think there is a need to make sure that you know, we are both listening to communities, engaging them, hearing what for their perspective is, but making sure we are also doing our own homework as well. Very, quick, <laughs> very quickly, I mean, it's very interesting to, to look at the, the prevention framework as a framework that actually can solve a lot of the issues that we have been trying to solve for a long time. One of them is multi-sectoral collaboration. It becomes an organizing framework that allows you to do a very systematic analysis specifically on protection of children, but then it gives you a way of working with other, what, with other sectors in an integrated and meaningful way. So it just basically brings it all together. And remember what the donors told us yesterday, go with multi-sectoral. So this is one of the frameworks that can allow you to do that. Uh, the other part is the localization. You cannot do primary prevention without directly engaging um, the local actors and the, and the, and the community. It's just impossible. As, as explained, it's very context specific. So it, and there's more that I have in my list, but because of time, I won't mention it, but it's, it, it is one of those things that can potentially solve multiple problems if, if our sector starts moving more and more to systematically doing prevention. Thank you very much, Michelle. For, Thanks, for Annie. Thanks session. everyone for coming.